Hello, my name is Kat Kerr, and I'm here today to talk to you about the reality of heaven. Many people don't either believe there is a heaven, or if they do, they're not really sure what's there. But I've been given a divine assignment, and it is my pleasure to share with you what I've been shown in that amazing place. God is revealing heaven now more than he ever has before in the past because of the days we're entering into on this earth. It's necessary that you know that heaven is real, that he is real, and if you're a believer, it's important to know whose image you're made in because once you know who he is, you'll know who you are. So in these last days, he is catching people up, taking them on tours of heaven and bringing them back to the earth. I just happen to be one of those people. And what the Father would like for you to know is heaven is a holy place. Uh, there's only one way there, that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. But when you get to heaven, you can't get any holier. So he wants you to know that when you get there, you are actually going to have fun. So I'm going to share tonight with a few of the places that he showed me and what it's like to live in that celestial realm. Heaven is huge. It's actually a planet, much bigger than our world. When Christ stood before the Sanhedrin court, he didn't say, I am not of this world. He said, I am not of this world. Because he's from the world called heaven. In the book of John, it says, that in my father's house are many mansions. And many people think, how could that possibly be? If God has a house, how could there be room for mansions in it? Well, when he says house, he's talking about the world called heaven. There are many places in the celestial realm in the atmosphere of heaven, but in heaven itself, there are millions of mansions. There's an amazing throne room. The streets of gold reflect the glory everywhere you go. People who live there couldn't possibly come back here and live after having experienced being with the Father or being with Jesus. You've never felt such love in your life. People ask me all the time, what did he look like? And I tell them, he looked like love. If you could imagine waves of this powerful love permeating every bit of your being, you feel like you're being pulled into his heart. And if you ever get close enough to see his eyes, you're never going to want to come back. You feel like you could never live apart from him. He's such an amazing being. And he is love. All love flows from him. All creation, all revelation, all wealth, all light. That's who God is. The great creator, the one who made everything that was or is or ever will be. He has always existed. That's one question you'll never get answered when you get to heaven. His name is I Am. And that tells you a lot right there. But because he does exist and he made us to be in his image, he made this amazing place for us to go home one day and live with him. Uh, there's many scriptures in the word that talks about heaven. In Hebrews 11, it talks about it being a country and a city. In Hebrews 12, 1, it talks about an amazing place. In heaven, it says there is a great cloud of witnesses. So run your race. Get the sin out of your life. Get any weight or anything that holds you back. Get it out of the way so you can get that goal. That would be heaven. We all came from heaven. In the book of Philippians, it says that our citizenship is in heaven. So you may be an American. You may be um, a, someone from Paris or from the UK or from Canada. Maybe you're a Canadian. But you know what? We really are all Havanians, if you want a nickname for that, because we came from that place, and God made a way for us to all come back home to him. The streets of gold reflect his glory no matter where you go. And I tell people, if there are streets here on earth and they take you places, then surely those, pla those streets in heaven take you somewhere also. And they do. Besides the throne room in your mansion, you actually create places called memorials of man. With your love and your kindness, you build these beautiful places that portray how you lived your life down here on earth for him. There's a place called the Hall of the Superheroes where God's intercessors, your faces are engraved in that place forever. You stand in the gap for him, for heaven's purposes in the earth, and God does not forget that. You receive many rewards in heaven. You actually have a treasure room in your own mansion. And a little later I'll tell you about some of those mansions I saw. But God wants you to know heaven is a literal place where you live a real life with him. Hi, this is Kat Kerr. I'm author of Revealing Heaven, and I'm here today with a revelation report on your guardian angel. Uh, one of the most asked questions given to me is, do I have a guardian angel? Do I have more than one? 
Will I ever get to meet them? What do they really do for me on this earth since I never see them? Well, I can tell you exactly what goes on around you in your everyday life. Your angel works very hard to protect you. And they're not sent when you're born. They're sent the day you're conceived. There's a scripture in the word of God that says, I knit you together in your mother's womb. And I can tell you when life begins, uh, at the time of conception, God takes a little spirit from himself. The Holy Spirit brings it down to this earth and he actually attaches that eternal spirit to that, uh, at that little bit of flesh that's taken place in the mother's womb. Until it happens, it's not a living human being. From that moment on, however, you do become a living human being. And when he sends your little spirit down here and he actually attaches or knits it to the flesh, the reason he does that is if he didn't do it, it would go right back to the Father. That's why when a believer dies, his spirit leaves and goes back to heaven. So they actually have to attach it. That's what revelation is on that scripture. He knit you together in your mother's womb. Doesn't mean he put your arms and legs on. It means he attached that little eternal spirit from himself into that little bit of flesh. And when he sends it, your guardian angel or angels come with you. Many times I'll see uh, pregnant women walking around and I see other angels with them. Those would be the baby's angels waiting on their birth. If, if at any time that baby doesn't make it all the way through to the birth date and they uh, pass from this life, whether through abortion or through miscarriage, their own angels will carry that little spiritual baby back to heaven. And let me tell you, even though that little flesh may not be fully formed, when that baby passes out of its body steps a perfectly formed little spiritual body. And those babies can see, they can talk, they can understand, they know who their parents are. But I just had to explain to you that your guardian angels come at that time and they stay with you your entire life on this earth and they actually get to help escort you back home to heaven. Now guardian angels are very different from one another. They do not all look the same. They actually kind of adapt to your personality, sometimes even to the colors that you like. And they will defend you to their very end. They will do everything they can within their power to help you become that mighty man or woman of God. They protect you at all costs. And let me tell you, when you get to heaven, you actually will find out how many times they actually saved your life and you didn't know it. And even when you go to church sometimes, there are demonic beings there trying to distract you, get you angry and offended. Your angels literally stand around you during that time so that they cannot interfere with your life. Your angels go everywhere you go, even if it's places you shouldn't be going into. Say, for instance, you go in to see a movie that you know belongs to the enemy. If you go into that movie, your angel will have to go with you, but they'll cover their eyes with their wings and will not watch what you are watching. You have to be careful where you go. You need to live your life like your angel actually is there because they are. Many times God will send other angels into your life during different seasons of your life. If he's given you a different assignment at different times, you may get more angels given to you at that time. And when that season ends, they'll go home to heaven. But your own guardian angel will never leave you. Even the very day you go home to heaven, they'll go with you. And I can tell you right now, they will have questions for you when you get there. Because they were with you, everything you experienced, you heard, you watched, every place you went, they were there with you. And their whole desire is to make sure you make it home to the Father. So you remember, you don't want to have to apologize to your guardian angel. So make sure you're living your life like heaven is watching because they are. And I hope one day that you too will have uh, the pleasure of going home and meeting your guardian angel one day. And uh, they will be like a friend in heaven. And no, they don't get reassigned. They earned that R&R &R after living with you on this earth. So I pray that one day... You'll be in heaven and that uh, you'll be living with the Father. If you want more information, you can go to my website, revealingheaven.com, or, or get one of my books, uh, Revealing Heaven series. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Hi, my name is Kat Kerr, and I'm here tonight to share with you about the mansions in heaven. God has caught me up many years and showed me um, tours of heaven, showed me many of the places he designed specifically for each individual when you come home there to live with him. I know that everyone probably thinks that they all look the same, or maybe heaven itself is just a place that's going to be different for everyone who goes there. But it's a literal place 
where you live an amazing life in your spiritual body. You're not a little spiritual being that will float through the walls of your mansion. God made you on the inside of you is a spirit. But when, this, when you die out of this body steps a spiritual body that looks just like you, but perfect in every way. And if he gives you a mansion, that means you're going to live there. He doesn't give you furniture or furnishing so you float through the walls. Many people seem to think that, but that's not true. If he gave you a mansion, that means you have property. And I've seen some of those mansions, and so now I'm going to uh, describe what some of those look like. I think one of the most amazing mansions he showed me was the Sky Mansions. And uh, a lot of people love this when I tell the story. There's columns that run 80 to 100 feet high up into the skies of heaven. And on the top of them are these beautiful uh, mansions. Most of them are round in, in, in detail. They're clear. You can see all the way through them. They may be anywhere from five to 8,000 square feet. You step into the bottom of that column and you just say the floor you want to go to and you're right there. It takes you right to that floor. All around the outside of your mansion is like a huge deck, also a landing pad where you would step out and there'd be your little star cruiser. The way I like to best describe them is there was an old cartoon show called The Jetsons. And I tell people, go check them out online if you have never seen them. Uh, it, they're very similar to that. And actually, a lot of the ideas that we see happening down here or created down here on Earth, those things came from heaven. And so these amazing sky mansions, you can step it on your deck and see all over heaven for miles away. Color, streaks of color go through the skies of the mansion all the time, uh, skies of heaven. It's like you get your own personal light show. Another mansion I saw was actually built under the Crystal Sea. They call them aqua mansions. People who love to be near the, the dolphins or the whales, they probably would love to live in a place like that. You actually have portals that you pass through and swim in the Crystal Sea and get to actually swim with the whales and the dolphins. It's fantastic. I've seen some mansions perched on the sides of cliffs 200 feet high in the skies of heaven with beautiful waterfalls cascading around them. Each mansion looks like a huge gemstone. And if you want to go to the back of your mansion, as you're walking, your whole mansion will turn and rotate as you walk. So whatever room you stop in, you still have that view of the falls. So there's many fantastic places to live in heaven. I told one person that I saw one that was built on the top of these 12 massive trees. It looked like the most futuristic tree house you could imagine. It didn't even have a roof on it, and the birds would fly in and sing to the people who lived there. Uh, the tree branches grew, grew right through the walls, and flowers would sing to the people in their home. They're fantastic places in heaven, and the reason they're not all the same is you're not the same. Everyone is an individual person. You all have your own likes and dislikes, your favorite colors and style. And I promise you, the reason you can't take anything with you is because it would be worthless compared to what God has for you in heaven. Your family and friends will live right near you. They'll visit you and stay with you for a while. Then you go visit other people. You fellowship all over heaven besides going to the throne room. Even the disciples will come and visit you in your mansion. And, and on your mansion's grounds are things that you always wanted to do but never could. For instance, if you always wanted to have a horse, I'm sure you have a hundred. You probably have a ranch with an amazing mansion on it and everything you need for people to come and ride those horses, God provides that for you. But you'll never have to clean them, feed them, worry about them getting sick. None of that happens in heaven. And their greatest desire will be to ride your family and friends all the time. And some of them actually will even fly. And I know you think this sounds fantastic, but you know what? We serve a supernatural God, and heaven is not a natural place. It is a supernatural place. Hi, this is Kat Kerr. I'm the author of Revealing Heaven, and I'm bringing you a revelation report today of the realities of the unseen realm. Uh, many people do not realize or even want to believe that there is a spiritual realm around them. They think that's all um, connected to the New Age movement, but let me tell you, the spirit realm was here long before the New Age movement was here. Um, it's always existed. It was the, the actual original realm before this physical realm was built that you now live in on this earth. God made this earth so that he would have a time-space planet that he could send us down here to be born, become uh, men and women, receive him, and go home, back home to him. And that's why he made this planet. But all around this planet and on this planet, there is also a spiritual realm. And that's where your angels are, your guardian angels. 
angels on assignment are here, scribe angels, courier angels. They have many duties sent from heaven down here to this earth. But the other guys are also here too. The demonic realm, the darkness, the satanic realm, whatever you want to call it. They also live in that spirit realm. And yes, they see everything you do. Your angel is not the only one that knows where you go. And they know what you're watching. The enemy also knows. And he has plots and plans against you. And the things you do in your life, you are either going to draw heaven into your life or hell into your life. You have to understand that on the inside of you is a spiritual body. And when you die and you leave that physical body, your spiritual body is going to go and live with whoever you belong to. You certainly want to make sure that you go home to heaven where you live an amazing life filled with love and joy and adventure. But should you go to the other place, you also will experience things, even in your spiritual body. You will experience all the pain, all the suffering, all the agony, all the fear. And let me tell you, God does not send anyone to hell. You choose to go there by rejecting the blood of Jesus Christ. In the spiritual realm, there aren't just spiritual beings, but there are spiritual places. There are kingdoms that have been built by the enemy, and he actually has kings, spiritual kings, that are some of the fallen angels that he has assigned to rule and reign over different regions on this earth, even some from the very atmosphere of the sky. There's also a second heaven. I'll talk about that later, but right now I want you to know that what you do in your life is going to either draw darkness in or light into your life. Uh, one of the ways I want to explain that is what happens when you pray in the spirit realm. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman availeth much. That would be much power. When you pray that way in the spirit realm, out of your mouth comes a sword. It begins to form. And when it's fully developed by your prayers, the angel of the Lord will take that sword and go and fight the enemy on behalf of what you just prayed for. Not the next day, not next week, but right then. Now that's the right way to live your life. When you speak things of God to people, encouraging words, words of life, out of your mouth and out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. You totally can bring heaven into your home by saying the right things. But in the spirit realm around you, when you trash people with your mouth, when you gossip, when you backbite, when you shred people, in the spirit realm, out of your mouth will come a cesspool. And let me tell you, it's as real as the river of life. And yes, even believers can do this with your mouth. You have a choice to use that mouth. It says that the power of life and death is in your tongue. So please choose life because when you don't, you're choosing death. That means you're allowing the enemy to come into your life and into your home. And if you don't repent for those words, that cesspool will not go away. Demons will come and swim in that cesspool and you just invited the enemy to come and move into your life. So you need to be careful the words you speak. The word of God says that blessing and cursing should not come out of the same fountain. That's talking about your mouth. That means that the things you say can affect your life, your family's life, even your finances, your body. You need to speak the right things. You need to read the book of James and the word of God. It'll tell you how to speak with your mouth. And let me tell you, the enemy wants you to say the wrong things. Even strife, when strife starts, there's a little tiny demon of strife. It's, it looks like a spider with a human head. And when an argument starts, it'll jump on your shoulder and prick you and give you words to answer back to that person who's just said something hateful or angry to you. And when you respond and say the words of the enemy, it gives them power in your words. Then it jumps to the other person's shoulder and it'll prick them and give the response back to you. And pretty soon hate is coming out of your mouth and you're just swimming in cesspools. And actually all domestic violence starts and ends that way. And if that person doesn't know God, they'll just keep going back and forth until the enemy finally has one of them say, I hate you. I wish you were dead. And the next thing you know, someone's been killed. And many times that happens. And when the police show up, they'll tell them, I don't even know why I did that. It's because they gave their self to the enemy with their words. Please don't let people backbite or gossip around you. I want you to know that angels collect your words, not just the words you speak, but the words that you allow to be spoken in your presence. Because God says whatever you allow in your presence, whether it's something you watch, you listen to, or people say around you, that means you are approving of those things. So we all need to repent for the words that we've spoken wrong, wipe them from our record, and start speaking words of life to one another. The same thing happens when you go into places where hell lives or operates. If you pick a movie that's maybe an R-rated movie that's got sadistic torture, a foul language, witchcraft, vampires, which by the way is a spirit of death. 
When you go into movie theaters and watch those things, there is a spiritual ledge that is built by the enemy above those theaters, those actual individual theater rooms. And when you walk in, you get vomited on by the enemy. They mark you with this green slime. I know this sounds wild, but you know what? That stuff is true. And you need to know how the enemy operates in your life as well as heaven. When you leave that theater, you think no one saw you go in there, but every demon you walk past knows that you just went in there. And they'll actually hunt you and get you to fall again and again. And pretty so much, you have so much scum on your uh, spirit that you can't hear heaven, you can't hear yourself, and you're doing things you never dreamed you would do. You need to be aware that the enemy has plans for you, and they are not good. They are only for harm. He comes to come to kill, steal, and destroy you. And you need to live your life like heaven is watching, and that there is a real spirit realm around you. And I pray that God opens your eyes and your ears so that you understand if you want to know more, you can go to my website at revealingheaven.com or, or get my book, Revealing Heaven. And I pray that you'll live your life in the right way, in the God way. Hello, my name is Kat Kerr. And today I'm going to give you the testimony of my life, why God takes me on tours of heaven, how that all started, and the process I had to allow him to take me through to prepare me to be able to speak for him. I know many people have asked me, why would he choose you? I can't really answer that question, but I can only tell you that he did ask me to go and I didn't say no. But I was also willing to let him process me in my life. You know, when you speak for God, you can't have pride in your life. You really have to have a humble spirit. And most of the time that comes through building character in your life. That means anytime you're gonna do something significant for God, there'll be a significant price that you will pay with your life. Part of that was done by allowing me to be raised with 14 siblings. I can tell you right there, that'll do something to sharpen you and get the rough edges off of you. And you'll learn right away that it's never gonna be about you, that you have to learn to share your life and the place you live with many other people. You have to consider their wants and their needs, not just your own. Also, God gave me an amazing father. My dad loved people. He had a personal, intimate relationship with the father with the Son and with the Holy Spirit, as did his mother. And we've actually traced back to the very early 1800s that we've had people in my family line that have walked on a foundation of holiness. Holiness is not the outward appearance, it's your heart. It's the condition of your heart. Are you willing to live a righteous life? Are you willing to lay down your life for others? Are you willing to walk in victory? Are you willing to take a stand against the enemy and not let him rule in your life? nor bring things of the world of the enemy into your life. And so I had to make a lot of sacrifices in my life. I spent four hours a night with the Lord. Usually from midnight to 4 a.m. was the time I spent with him for years, probably close to 20 years. And then he even took me out of my job and took me home for three years to spend eight to 10 hours a day with, a day with him. This was spent worshiping him, just talking to him like I am you. You know, you can have as much of him as you want in your life. And there were many other ways he prepared me for this, but I can tell you that after having lived my life for him, I've been born again from the age of four, and I'll be 60 this next year, and I don't mind sharing that. I think the pink hair helps a little bit with that. And by the way, if you wonder why I have pink hair, it wasn't my idea. In 1996, the Lord walked in my home after many years of being prepared and told me the Father and he were gonna start taking me on tours of heaven, and I didn't say no. I am caught up by the Spirit of God, just like John in the book of Revelation, where instantly he was there. I don't feel myself traveling. My spirit is taken from my body by the Holy Spirit, and then I'm somewhere in heaven. God allows me to listen to people talk about their family members, shows me their mansions, brings me back to earth, gives me information about the family members on earth, and then has me share it with them. I did that year after year, you know, not really sharing it with a lot of people some of my friends, maybe some of the church staff where I fellowship at. But that was something God had me do. I can tell you it changed people's lives for years. And then in 2005, the Lord walked back in my home and told me that he and the Father wanted me to write a book about everything I've been shown in heaven. They wanted me to illustrate it so you actually saw places that existed in the heavenly realm. And then they actually asked me to have pink highlights in my hair. I thought about that for a minute and the Lord looked at me and he goes, it's necessary. Because when the world sees this book and reads this book, and they know that you have pink hair and you have a relationship with us, they're going to know that we want them, and he does want them. We're supposed to love one another in this earth, 
And even the word says that the world will know us, the believers, by our love for one another. So make sure you're loving and not judging and not criticizing. I had to train my mouth to speak words that God wanted to say and not myself. And so you have to understand that if you really want to do something for him, lay down your life, lose your life that you can find in him, and he'll fill you with himself. And when you share to other people, you'll release a river of life into their being. So I just wanted you to know that God loves you. He has a plan for your life. He wants you to come and spend eternity with him in heaven. So please consider, if you don't know the Lord, receiving him this day, repenting of your sins, and believing that he is the chosen one that paid a price for your life on Calvary. And then one day, we can all enjoy heaven together. Hi, this is Kat Kerr, and I'm the author of Revealing Heaven, but my favorite title would be Child of God. You know, God says you have to be like a little child to enter into the kingdom of heaven, and I really have an understanding of why he says that, because when you get there, you're going to have fun. You know, God may be eternal, but he is not an old-minded God. If that were so, he wouldn't want you to be like children. That means you trust him completely. That means you receive whatever it is he gives you with gladness and joy. And one of the reasons he enjoys taking me to heaven is I never question him. I don't sit down and try to figure everything out. I don't have to look for 50 references to share what I saw there. I'm like a big kid. I can't wait to tell you what he allowed me to see there. And today I'm going to give you um, a report on what it's like to live there in heaven. One of the times he caught me up to heaven, what I was allowed to see in the life of a 13-year-old girl who had passed away in February of 2001. Um, my mother and I did hospitality at our church, and we had just finished a four-day event. We were very tired. But because we served our pastor and his wife, we allowed them to ask special privileges from us, and that's exactly what they did. We had a phone call from the pastor's secretary, pastor's wife's secretary, and she asked if we could clean the house of an elderly woman who had just hosted out-of-town guests for a funeral. Now, this funeral was not held at our church. It was held about 50 miles away in a different part of our city. So we did not know these people that I'm about to share you, share about. And uh, we never met them before. Uh, we had never been to this person's house before. So my mother said, yes, we'd be glad to clean the home. So the next day we, sh we showed up, and my mom told me I could go ahead and start dusting the fireplace mantle. She would go start in the kitchen or the bathroom. And so I'm standing there dusting the fireplace mantle, and all of a sudden I hear the Lord say to me, I'd like to give Melody a message. And I keep dusting, and I say, well, who's Melody? And he says, that's Marissa's mom. And I go, well, who's Marissa? And he says, that's the young girl who just died in the ski accident. You're standing in her grandmother's home. I want her mother to know that I did not cause her daughter's death. But I had a plan for her life in heaven. And I had to decide, was I done with her on earth? Did I have something more important for her to do in heaven? And I want her to know that she's living with her great-grandfather and he's taking her somewhere to have lots of fun. Well, the Lord kept talking. Then all of a sudden, I was no longer standing in front of the fireplace. I was on a path in heaven. The Lord told me to hurry up, and so I could hear the people. There was three people on the path in front of me. Now, you have to understand, when you're caught up to heaven, it's not just like walking down the path of any, any woods down here on earth. Angels are flying by you. The flowers sing to you when you walk by. There's light shows continually going on in heaven. You hear music coming from everything because everything worships God in heaven. And so it was hard to uh, not focus, but I finally got up there, and I heard this young, beautiful girl. She has strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes. I knew that was Marissa, and she was looking into the eyes of someone who did not look like a great-grandfather. He looked like he was in his 20s. He, she was saying things to her, to him about her mom. When I see her again, I'm going to kiss her on both cheeks. I'm going to share everything that's happened to me. I wish, I, I wish she knew that I was a youth leader in heaven. And so she just kept sharing, and I was listening, and we got closer. I could hear people laughing and hollering and yelling, and all of a sudden, I see a roller coaster in the distance, and I'm shocked. And the Lord said, that's the rush. That's our largest roller coaster, and that's where her great-grandfather was taking her. I got close enough to see the people. This roller coaster, this cars would zip up to the top, go all the way to the bottom, and zip back up and leap off the track, go across the sky to the other side of the track. And I thought, they sure don't do that on earth. And so she kept talking about her mom. And then the next thing I knew, I was back down in front of the fireplace. I was really shocked. 
And so I called my mom. We called the pastor's secretary, and, and uh, they gave us Melody's phone number. I went home, typed everything down I heard, and she agreed to meet me at a mall. And so I started sharing with her that I had seen her daughter in heaven, and I saw her great-grandfather taking her on roller, to go take on roller coaster rides, and she almost fainted. I asked her if she wanted me to keep reading, and she just motioned to keep going. I kept telling her all the things I heard, and Melody would laugh, then she would cry. She began to shake, and I knew what she was going to say when I was finished. I asked her, do you believe I've seen your daughter in heaven? Do you believe God wants you to have this information? And she looked at me, she goes, I don't know you, I never met you, but you told me things only my daughter Marissa would know. Every day I dropped her off at school, she would kiss me on both cheeks, and when she came home from school, she would share everything that happened in her life. And I, she said, the thing I really know that convinced me that you had been to heaven is the day before her funeral, I was in her room, and I looked under her bed and found a journal she had kept in 1995. Now this experience I had happened in February of 2001, so this was some time ago. Melody said I had never even seen this journal before, so I started reading it. And she said, on one of the pages, I read these words. Last night I dreamed I died early and went to heaven early. My great-grandfather met me, and I went on roller coaster rides. I saw tons of mansions, and it was wonderful, but he only gave me a peek, and then I fell back down to earth. How amazing is that? I was so shocked. There's no way I could have known about that journal or the words that were written in it, and yes, the very thing that the Father showed me. He wanted people to know that heaven is real, but it's not just a literal place. You're actually going to have fun. She told me that that information was like receiving kisses from heaven, that she loved her daughter very much. And then the Lord allowed me to share with her what she was doing in heaven. He said it was time for all the youth in heaven to begin their part in rehearsing the, their, the entertainment for the celebration of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he looked down through time and eternity, and he picked Marissa for that position. So just because one of your loved ones goes home early, it doesn't mean that it was a punishment or that the enemy had his way. Sometimes it's because God has a reward for their life. Melody shared with me that Marissa had mentored all the kids in her elementary school and her middle school by loving them. And she said she could understand why God would have picked her daughter. What a high honor to be chosen for in heaven. But God wants you to know when you go there, you are going to have a life filled with adventure. And your loved ones who live there, uh, they miss you, they love you. But you know what? They're with the one who loves them more than anybody. So I hope you make the right choice with your life. And you understand that when you go home to heaven, it's like living and moving to the most amazing place you'll ever live. So if you want to know more, you can read my book, Revealing Heaven, or go to my website, revealingheaven.com. And I hope you come to know the Lord and give your life to him. Hi, this is Kat Kerr, and I'm the author of Revealing Heaven, and today I'm going to talk about something that is probably so desired by many people to know, and that is the mystery of death. And I can tell you, when a believer dies, they do not experience death. The Word of God says that Christ experiences that for you. When a believer dies, they depart for heaven. They don't descend into the ground. And actually, um, before Christ died on the cross, anyone who was counted to be righteous uh, by their faith in God himself, they actually did descend into Abraham's bosom. But now that place is empty. They're no longer there. They now all live in heaven with the Father. But I'm going to tell you what happens from the very second your, your spirit leaves your body all the way up till you get to heaven and what happens after you get there. And let me tell you, you should be excited when a family member of yours departs from this world and they're going home to spend eternity with the one who loves them the most. That would be the Father. And so when you die, no matter what you're experiencing prior to that moment, whether it was uh, a natural death, like you died of old age, or maybe it was an unexpected death, maybe an accident, or even something terrible that happened, maybe even murder, I can tell you that if that person was a believer, the second their spirit stepped out of their body, they no longer even thought about how they died. They are engulfed in the love and the glory of God. For the first time, they'll see their guardian angels. It's an amazing experience. The glory of God comes from the very clothing that they wear. Sometimes you can even hear sounds from heaven. 
And I'll, let you, I'll just tell you right now that if you're in a room when a loved one dies, please look up and wave goodbye to them because that's what they're doing to you. They wave goodbye to their loved ones if they're present in the room. They even blow you kisses. Even, either a transport or a chariot is waiting on them. When you die and you're going to live in heaven, they actually come and pick you up. And the way the Father put it was, whoever owned you when you die will come for you. And many times, if you've really lived your life for God, poured it out for others, sometimes even Jesus himself comes and picks you up in his own chariot. They escort you out of this realm, up to the heavenlies, through outer space. You get to see all the beauty and the wonder of everything God put up there. You go right through the galaxies, past the beautiful nebulas that are in the skies, um, in the outer space. Many people call it the prophetic frontier. God made that and all the beautiful things in there for us to enjoy watching and looking at. And now you get a front view right here in front of you as you go past, zipping up uh, faster than the speed of light until you finally see the brightest thing you'll ever see in your life. That would be the planet heaven. Angels pour off of the planet to welcome you home. You come up to a landing pad and when you, di when you disembark, You'll see the glow from the glory of God, the city of God, beyond the gates. Your family and friends will be pouring out of those gates, grabbing you. They can't wait to see you. If you had lost a child or even miscarried a baby at any time in your life, they'll be waiting for you. You don't have to look for your family and friends. You'll be able to walk right into the river of life and pick the water up and drink out of it. You'll be escorted into the throne room of God where everyone there will part like the Red Sea. Jesus comes down the steps of the throne and he escorts you back home to the Father. Every step you walk up on that throne, you look into those steps, you see creation taking place because life everlasting pours from the person of the Father. It is Jesus' greatest desire and pleasure to escort you back to him. And then he'll turn you around and say, look, my son, my daughter, they've come home. And everyone in there will begin to celebrate that you're home in heaven. Everyone knows your name when you come there. They'll have a big celebration party in the throne room. I think it's a little strange that on earth we have a funeral, but in heaven they have a party when someone comes home. Up there they're rejoicing and down here we're grieving. We need to understand that if your loved one belongs to the Lord, they're in heaven living an amazing life. And if they could say anything to you, it would be this. We can't wait till you get here. We can't wait till you see what he has given us, the rewards we have, our amazing mansion, what it's like to just stand and be held by the arms of the Father and then take him back down the steps of the throne and everyone dances with you everywhere you go. And then your family and friends eventually, when they can get you out of the throne room, and the unspeakable glory that just abides there. They'll take you to your own mansion where they themselves have been collecting you presents and gifts. And you have another welcome home party in your own mansion. I tell people you do worship God in heaven. You do praise him continually. They call it living worship because every time you walk into your mansion to see what he gave you, you're going to praise him. When you walk down the streets of gold and see all the beautiful, wonderful things he made for you to enjoy, you're going to praise him. One person can just shout, praise God, and it echoes all over heaven. It starts a chain reaction, and everyone once again begins to celebrate the love, of the Father that he has for you. So you don't want to miss going to heaven. You don't want to miss living with him. Never again to experience death or fear or grief or anxiety. Everyone there knows you. They'll call you by your first name. You'll even meet family members that were in your family line hundreds of years ago. You'll be surprised how much they know about you. So I hope that one day you can call heaven your home and just know this, that your loved ones are living there in a beautiful place. They haven't died. Their body may be dead, but their spirit is very much alive. And they'll be even more pronounced in their character and their personality than they ever were on this earth. So I want you to know that they want you to know that they love you, that they declare God's will over your life, and they're having a wonderful time living with the Father in heaven. If you want to know more, you can read my book, Revealing Heaven, or go to my website, revealingheaven.com. And God bless you.